wanted to talk a little bit on uh, mouthwash and fluoride yeah. and the microbiome in the mouth and how important that is because this is where the stuff is like the nitric oxide. Well, I'll let you explain that. Can you yeah. explain why why we're doing something like we think is hygienic to do mouthwash every morning? You know, like millions of us do. Why the heck right. is that destroying our nitric oxide production? Historically, in medicine, there's a good intent and the reason people do things. So we know about an oral systemic link, meaning that people who have poor oral hygiene have higher incidence of heart attack and stroke and cardiovascular disease. So the approach was if these bacteria in the mouth are causing cardiovascular disease, let's just kill them, right? So they use antiseptic mouth. Well, now fast forward 20 or 30 years and the human microbiome has been completely mapped. And we now realize that the bacteria that live in and on our body outnumber our own human cells 10 to one. Hmm. And most of these bacteria, I would say 99% of the bacteria that live in and on our body are there as what we call symbionts. It's a symbiotic relationship. They're providing essential metabolic processes for the human that we can't do. And then the human's providing them an, a host, a, a kind of a, a safe host for them to replicate and do their job. So part of the second pathway we we talked about when you get nitrate from the vegetables and then this can be converted into nitric oxide in the body, it's dependent upon the oral bacteria because humans do not have a, a nitrate reductase enzyme. Mm -hmm. So again, it's the role of the bacteria that live in and on our body, primarily the oral cavity that perform this first metabolic activation of inorganic nitrate from our vegetables. And then the saliva is then concentrated in nitrite and we swallow our own saliva, we get a burst of nitric oxide gas in the stomach. So probably, uh, when was it? Probably 15, 20 years ago, some of the first studies came out showing that if you use mouthwash, people who use mouthwash saw an increase in blood pressure. And then we came on and tried to figure out, okay, what bacteria are responsible for maintaining normal blood pressure? Because this is a new paradigm in, mm -hmm. in management of hypertension, right? So we found that if you eradicate the oral microbiome, through antiseptic mouthwash, then it disrupts the conversion of nitrate to nitrite and nitric oxide. Your blood pressure goes up, you lose the protective benefits of exercise, and bad things happen. So in the US, two out of three Americans, or about 200 million Americans, wake up every morning and use mouthwash. Mm. Sometimes they do this two or three times a day. And two out of three Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Then in 2019, we showed for the first time that this is causal. So when you eradicate the bacteria, we took normal, intensive, really young, healthy medical students, dental students, and we just gave them mouthwash twice a day for seven days, monitored their blood pressure, did tongue scrapings. And we found that after seven days, in several people, their blood pressure would go up 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury okay. just by eradicating the bacteria. We didn't change their diet. We didn't change their exercise. We didn't change nothing. We just killed the bacteria in their mouth, and we caused clinical hypertension in these patients. Amazing. It so we have to we have to account for the the oral microbiome. And you know, there's a reason that your physician, if you have you know a bacterial infection, that you take an antibiotic for maybe 10 days at most, right? Exactly. So why we is don't that? Take, we know antibiotics are bad for us. You, like know, we have you to... do not take an antibiotic every day for the rest of your life because mm -hmm. of the collateral damage and the systemic effect and really systemic disease chronic antibiotics cause. So the same concepts apply in the oral cavity, you should not and you cannot use an antiseptic every day for the rest of your life. You can, but there's going to be some really deadly clinical consequences to that. It's going to be erectile dysfunction, high blood pressure, increased risk of heart attack and stroke, uh, and, and bad things happen. So I tell people, if you're using mouthwash, you have to stop. The other problem is fluoride. You know, fluoride's in the water, it's in toothpaste. Yep. It's not only it an antiseptic. Ass. Yeah, yeah. it's not only an antiseptic that kills the bacteria, but it kills your thyroid function, and it's a neurotoxin. Mm. It's one of the toxic, one of the most toxic elements on the periodic table, and yet they put it in water and put it in our... Like proton pump inhibitors, I'm talking about like your meprazoles, your antacids, your Tums, your, you know, all of these yep. things that people take for acid reflux or <clears throat> heartburn. Where are we going wrong here? Well, look, I've never understood this. I'm a, I'm a biochemist and physiologist by training, and it's you cannot suppress stomach acid production and expect the human body to perform. <laughs> There's a reason our stomach, our parietal cells in our stomach make hydrochloric acid. You need it to break down proteins into amino acids. 
you need acid to, to absorb things like iron and B vitamins and selenium and chromium and iodine. So without stomach acid, then none of you don't get absorption of nutrients. You don't get protein broken down into amino acids. You start absorbing peptide fragments and it's the basis for autoimmune disease and all foodborne allergies. It's lack of stomach acid. So that, that right there creates a problem on its own that's, that creates most of the world's health problems. Mm -hmm. But as it relates to nitric oxide, if you these proton pump inhibitors actually prevent, they inhibit an enzyme that leads to a breakdown of asymmetric dimethyl arginine. So then you get a buildup of this metabolite and that shuts down nitric oxide production. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is, you know, when we talk about swallowing our own saliva, so even if you have the right bacteria and you swallow your saliva, that nitrite in the saliva is designed to produce nitric oxide gas in the acid environment of the stomach. But if there's no acid being produced because there are all these antacids, then you basically completely inhibit nitric oxide production from both pathways. And now there's data that people have been on these drugs for three to five years, have 40% higher incidence of heart attack and stroke. And just two weeks ago, there was a new study out to the people who have been on these drugs for four years have a 35 to 40% higher incidence of dementia and wow. Alzheimer's. So these, these drugs are deadly. They're killing people. And I tell these should be, there should be a black box warning on these drugs, just like there was on Celebrex and Biox, COX-2 inhibitors back in the early 2000s. There's clear evidence that people who take these have heart attack and strokes. The mechanism is very well defined. And we have to get these drugs off the market and start weaning patients off of these antacids. They're not only dangerous, uh, but they prevent the human body from doing its job. If we go back to um, this, when the, the Nobel Prize came out and then there was a whole lot of companies that came on the market that had nitric oxide boosting supplements, yeah. And, and, and it was great, you know, like, uh, and I've tried a lot of them over the years and that, you know, we didn't see the results necessarily because, I mean, as an athlete, we were all on beetroot powder and, you know, things like that. Um, where, where have they gone wrong there and why are, are some, you know, not all um, uh, nitric oxide supplements created equal? Well, it's called advancement of science and knowledge, right? What we know today is much different than what we knew in 1998 when the Nobel Prize was awarded. So that really put nitric oxide on the map. I mean, the Nobel Prize is awarded for, for discoveries that, that changed the landscape of mankind mm -hmm. and humanity. So it's a fundamental discovery for us, the Nobel Prize would be awarded. At that time, we knew that there, there was an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase that converted L-arginine, which is amino acid, into nitric oxide. So then a number of companies flooded the market with, with nitric oxide products that contain L-arginine, right? But now understanding the enzymology and the biochemistry in patients who are nitric oxide deficient is that the enzyme that converts arginine to nitric oxide is broken, it's dysfunctional, and it does not convert arginine. So giving more arginine does not lead to any nitric oxide. In fact, now many studies show that giving arginine to a patient with an uncoupled NOS can actually cause more harm. Wow. In two studies, yeah. post-infarct patients, so patients who had suffered a heart attack were given high-dose arginine to try to improve nitric oxide, to try to improve outcome, and it killed more people than the placebo. They repeated that study in patients with peripheral heart disease, which have endothelial dysfunction, and they get worse. So giving arginine to a patient that's nitric oxide deficient is like putting gas in a car with a blown-up engine. Mm. Right? They're not out of fuel. You're never out of arginine. You just lost the ability to convert them. So that, that was kind of the first products to hit the market. And, you know, then in 2012, in the London Olympic Games, it was revealed that most of these athletes were drinking liters of beetroot juice because mm -hmm. there was, you know, some really good clinical studies showing that beetroot contained nitrate, which could be converted to nitric oxide, improved your performance. Yeah, I did it. So then <laughs> a number of companies brought to market beetroot juice. You know, I've tested probably every market, every product on the market. And most of these don't contain any nitrate, no nitrite, no nitric oxide activity whatsoever. So these are just, oh. we call them dead beets. They're dead beet products. <laughs> they don't do anything except turn your pee and your poop uh, red and right. pink and cause a lot of anxiety. <laughs> so th those are the two main products out there. And the companies that do this are just trying to, you know, capitalize on the, the market and the awareness around nitric oxide, but they have no idea about the underlying science and what it takes to make nitric oxide in the human body. Mm. Those were my frustrations. That's what led me to develop nitric oxide products because 
we know how the human body makes it. We know what goes wrong in people that can't make it. And we can fix this and provide, you know, a source of nitric oxide that our whole process was, if your body can't make it, then we got to do it for you. But we also understand why your body can't make it and we can fix that. So that's what we do, what no one else does. And now there's companies out there who certainly know better, but they continue to, to defraud and deceive their customers by, you know, selling beets or gummies and all this other crap that they know better, but yet they're still trying to do it to, to capitalize on the growth of the nitric oxide market. So I tell yeah. people just buy or beware. Don't, don't believe the, the people who spend the most money on advertising. Look for real science and people who understand the enzymology and biochemistry of nitric oxide. Yeah, and that, that's the key thing because it's a nitric oxide synthase, the, the uncoupling of the, the the enzyme, that's the problem, isn't right. it? So so that's you, right. with your, you've got two sort of products. So for those watching on YouTube, that's one of them. That's the lozenge um, yep. that we've, that I'm on and mum's on um, and that is something you take like every 12 hours and it dissolves in your mouth and so this so explain this one versus the yep. the the second product that you have sure well I have to remind people that nitric oxide is a gas right and so when it's produced it's gone in less than a second so there's only finite ways you can deliver nitric oxide you can't deliver nitric oxide in a gummy you cannot deliver nitric oxide in a capsule. So there has to be a way that you can generate this gas. And so again, I figured out that we could create this matrix that we put these components together. Then when you put it in your mouth, it slowly dissolves. So I intentionally designed that to have a resident time of about five to six minutes. Mm -hmm. But as that matrix and that laws are just falling apart, these active components are coming together and we're generating nitric oxide gas. So again, it's the only solid dose form of nitric oxide gas. Yes. 